Hi, my name is Lisa Kalpeninger and I'm the director of the Carl Sagan Institute here at Cornell. And today we're going to bring you more science behind the cosmos. We just finished what's in seven wonders of the new world and what an amazing future we could have if we build it on science and technology. And so if you want to know more about the science behind it, let us show you. My name is Buzz Bosto. Um, I'm, uh, I'm an assistant professor uh, here at Cornell in the Department of Biological Engineering. Um, I'm also a fellow of the Carl Sagan Institute. Uh, my lab works on systems and synthetic biology and sustainable energy. Hello, my name is Morgan Irons and I am a PhD student at Cornell University in the field of soil and crop sciences. I work with Dr. Johannes Lehman on biogeochemical cycles in uh, soil science and I am a fellow at the Carl Sagan Institute. Hi, I'm Hunter Adams. I'm a lecturer of aerospace engineering at Cornell University and a member of the um, Carl Sagan Institute. And my research involves designing, building, and launching very small satellites, uh, satellites small enough to fit in your wallet. So, Buzz, a vision for the future, a vision for a world fair in the far future built on the best of technology and science we have. One of the pieces that struck me was this tower of light, this calcium carbonate structure that we built in the future from CO2 that we sequestered from the air. But what other things, or how would this work, and what other things could we do by utilizing biology to help us out? We know that there's already an existence proof for solving the climate problem, thanks to photosynthesis. Uh, we also know, you know, just thanks to sort of bio to, to geochemistry, that there's also a, a sort of an existence proof for sequestering CO2 from the atmosphere in terms of sort of carbonate minerals. And what we'd like to do is sort of mash those two together to sort of combine the speed of photosynthesis and the sort of storage stability of, uh, of weathering. I really hope that, you know, in the next few decades that we will have sort of harnessed unusual biology to, to solve this problem. All of the advances that we'll make in genetic engineering over that time could have the side benefit that they'll also make sort of matter and energy as easy to manipulate as information is today. You could, you could imagine almost like a sort of a worldwide web of materials. So we could do something like build a, you know, a circular economy that's based not on sort of extraction of materials from the earth, but constant recycling of them. So we never have to worry about polluting the atmosphere again. We can just continue to grow and grow and grow based upon sort of upon technologies that are of increasing complexity, you know, of increasing imagination, but don't have any environmental footprint. You can also imagine that we can harness biology. You know, the, one of the most amazing features that brought me into biology from physics was this ability to self-repair and self-assemble. I remember one of the things that so inspired me was sort of reading Arthur C. Clarke and watching sort of TV science fiction shows. And something that I would love to achieve over the course of my career would be sort of building mega structures with biology, like a space elevator that would allow you to drop the cost of bringing things into orbit to, you know, negligible amounts. Uh, or even sort of growing spaceships. When we get to the end of the century, you know, I think we're going to look back and we'll think, gosh, you know, that, that was the century of biology. But it was also the century of sort of combining the sort of the physical sciences with biology and using it to solve sort of many of the pressing problems of today and unleashing this potential. The vision of even growing spaceships is fascinating. And so as Buster just told us, we might be growing spaceships, but how will we live there? Or even how could we live on places like Mars? So we would have to sustain and we'd have to bring some seeds if you want, not just seeds in terms, but in terms of soils and microbial communities. And Morgan, that's something you're working on, right? A lot of my research does look at that. Currently, as a PhD student at Cornell, my research is focusing on microbial and organomineral stabilization mechanisms in soil aggregates and their contribution to the persistence and long-term stabilization of solar organic matter and carbon. So that's something that I've been focusing on for my PhD research, but 
for my overall research that I've been doing since I was an undergraduate at Duke University, I've been working on this question of closed ecological systems for space habitation. And that's terminology that has been used for over a century now, with the first mentionings of it being in Dreams of Earth and Sky, which was a book written, I believe, in the 1890s by Dr. Zoyskovsky. I'm sorry if I mispronounce his name, but he is the father of rocketry, but a lot of people don't know that he was also an uh, author. And he was the one who first really envisioned and showed through literature what a closed ecological system could be like in space. With the work that I've been doing, I've actually moved past the term closed ecological systems and developed my own term for it, which I call quasi-closed agroecological systems. So when we think about agricultural systems in space, we may think about Dr. Gerard O'Neill and his fantastical visions of spaceships that have these beautiful ecological systems that we would see here on Earth, but in space. And then we also have movies like The Martian, which always comes up when I talk about this, where we see the growth of potatoes on the Martian surface. What I envision with the research that I've been doing in this area is that we need to really understand how ecological systems develop and understand the soil science behind that because everything starts off with bare rock and sand. A lot of what we have here on Earth started off with just that initial degraded geological substrate. So understanding what species we need to bring. This includes microorganisms as well as pioneer species that can start to prepare the soil for other species such as the trees, such as the agricultural crops that we see here on Earth. So this is an actual process and the theory of this is called ecological succession. For example, if we were on Mars, what I see is a enclosed agricultural system on the surface of Mars and we've made it safe and habitable for plants and microorganisms and we start to develop this ecological system and we start to introduce a biodiversity of different plants because when we're thinking about agriculture we also have to think about the social element as well as the ecological element of this. You're talking about you need that biodiversity because if you have a pest come in, you want to make sure that some of your plants survive that. So you want that genetic diversity. You also want a biodiversity of species because you don't want to be eating just potatoes. You want to be able to bring your food culture with you. You want to eat your, be able to make your pastas, be able to add your spices that you are used to from your culture. And so by having this diverse, beautiful agroecological system, we're able to allow people to thrive and live in an environment that is able to give back to you as well as you giving back to it. So now we have potentially self-grown spacecraft. We have uh, biodiversity on Mars where I can get my own spices. Thank you very much. And now how do you think technology actually can enable us to explore our own planet and also the planets in our own solar system, maybe very, very different from what we do right now? Probably that's what you're working on, right? So my work surrounds designing, building, and launching very, very small satellites. So satellites that would fit in your wallet or in your pocket. And what's interesting about satellites that are that small is you can fit a lot of them on a rocket. So if you watch a, a rocket launch, that rocket is generally speaking carrying one big satellite and maybe a handful of other satellites, but it's less than 10 almost always. With satellites as small as the ones that I'm working on, you could fit tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of these little satellites on the rocket and carry them all into space at once. What's interesting about that today is it enables a totally different type of science in space. It enables very, very distributed sensing. So if you're interested in studying something like an upper atmosphere, this is exactly the sort of sensor that you'd like to use to do that because the upper atmosphere is this crazy dynamic field that you would really like lots of sensors moving around in in order to understand. 
as opposed to something like a weather balloon, which tells you something, but it's a data point in a big field. So they're interesting for these sort of distributed sensing experiments. The atmosphere is an example. The surfaces of other planets are examples. What's particularly interesting to me about these, though, is the sort of future missions and implications of this type of technology. One of the very interesting characteristics of satellites like this, of missions that involve satellites like this, is that mission success does not depend on the survival of every single individual satellite. You can think about this almost like an ant colony, right? The ant colony has some sort of goal and the success of the colony does not depend on the success of every individual ant. And in fact, the expectation is that many ants will die in, in uh, helping the colony. That's not the case for conventional satellites. The stakes are very high for conventional satellites. And if that set conventional satellite dies, the mission's over. So if you, you're using a satellite where the success of the mission does not necessarily depend on the success of individual satellites, it enables much more wide scale participation. So the future for these that I envision is one where we can take advantage of the collective creativity of people in space exploration. So very, very similar to what you see in like the open source community, where you open up a, a source code and allow people to do software development on the source code. And you end up with a software product that is the result of the collective creativity of everyone that's worked on it. And you get farther as a result of that. Technology like this, I think, enables this sort of open source mentality for space exploration. It enables whole scale participation. And what's exciting to me about that is that, to me, is what distinguishes a futuristic society from sort of a current present day society. This new approach to space exploration, isn't it even providing us a new exit to places where we've never gone before, like, for example, our next star over? It turns out that because these things are so small, you can do some really interesting things, actually. And one of the interesting things you can do as a consequence of their size is go very fast. It's, it, with the same amount of energy, you can make small things go faster than larger things, right? So if you give one of these very small satellites a large kick, you can get it moving very, very quickly. One of the projects that I'm working on is trying to take this to almost the logical extreme, where the notion is to build a version of these small satellites that is made of a material that's very reflective. So a, the most advanced mirror that's ever existed. And the notion is to, to hit that satellite with a very, very large laser. And if you do back and envelope calculations on this, if you build a laser that is large enough, you can show that you can accelerate one of these little chipsets, we call them, these tiny satellites, to significant fractions of the speed of light, about 20% the speed of light, which is exciting because that means that you could get one of these from our solar system to the nearest star, Proxima Centauri, in the span of a human lifetime. And what's even more exciting about that is there's a planet in a habitable zone there. So we could get human technology to another star system. So Buzz, when you think about a world star in the future, what is the thing that you want to see? First exhibit I'd like to go to in the future world's fair. It'd all be about carbon sequestration. And I'd love it if somebody would come up with an exhibit that has microorganisms that are eating solar electricity and then using that to capture CO2 from the atmosphere and perhaps growing like a miniature potted tree of life. The second exhibit I'd really like to go to would be uh, one where we're using biology to grow advanced materials. I would love it if they could show something like a, a car body that was be made out of sort of maybe sort of biologically synthesized nanotubes or biologically synthesized graphene that was being grown in the lab. I think that would be really cool. That sounds definitely like a place I want to go to too. Morgan, what would you like to see? I would like to see an exhibit that shows plants being grown from these environments that have been degraded here on Earth as well as on Mars and on the moon and seeing how the process that we've started off with this de degraded environment or this environment that's gone through desertification like in China or even here in the United States in the Midwest and seeing just like the process 
of where we were in 2020 and where we are now in 2035 and the process that we've gone to where we started off with this integrated environment and how we've been able to use science and technology and stuff we've learned from growing food in space and doing soil science in space and how we've gotten to the point where we have this lush environment here on earth and i think that would just give so much hope hunter what would you like to say i would like to go to a virtual reality exhibit and the wearer of whatever the virtual reality technology is at the time will be will have the experience of moving through the solar system and moving through our local neighborhoods so moving through interstellar space to nearby star systems which will be awesome in its own right but the chill inducing moment of this exhibit will be in part of this experience, little indicators indicating the location of man-made sensors will be turned on so that overlaid on top of the environments that you're seeing, you'll be able to see where all of the sensors are that are gathering scientific information, and there will be lots of them. On top of that even, I would love to see as close to real time as possible with the latency that it takes for information to get to us, the data from these sensors being displayed to the wear as they're moving through the environment that the sensors are occupying so that you would have the perspective of one of the probes moving through the solar system in interstellar space, seeing the other probes around you. One of the other things that this episode brought home was the idea that at this point in time, we'll have an encyclopedia of knowledge about our galactic neighboring worlds. And of course, that speaks extremely to the science that I do. So exploring planets around us and hopefully finding science of life, understanding our place in the cosmos while we explore our own solar system ever further. We take care of our own planet. We bioengineer our way out of the bind that sometimes we find ourselves in because we don't understand the ramification of some of the technologies. But I think that safeguarding our own place and looking out in the cosmos to find these possible worlds that's going to be a beautiful legacy. So I hope you enjoyed the science of cosmos and the insights into some of the fascinating research we do here at the Carl Sagan Institute. If you don't want to miss anything, more content is coming. Subscribe below.